This week we look at number nine in the series, looking at the book of Hebrews. This one's entitled Jesus the Perfect Sacrifice. And immediately we need to stop and think a little bit about what we mean about Jesus being the perfect sacrifice. Because as we look back at the Old Testament, we realize that God had demanded that any sacrifice that was brought had to be without spot or blemish, not injured in any kind of way. And then we kind of apply that to Jesus. But it's talking about things in a very different kind of context. We're talking about Jesus spiritually and most of all as God who is here with us. And we also must realize that this isn't Jesus as a sacrifice to pay God, which is the way that all too often things were viewed in the Old Testament. You gave a sacrifice because God demanded it, because God wanted it, because he needed the blood, and that was the understanding. We can't apply those kinds of ideas to the sacrifice of Jesus, not at all. God is not demanding the blood of Jesus. He's not saying, I need a perfect sacrifice and only my son will do, or something like that. That is an appalling travesty of what Jesus did there on the cross and as we look at the, the material we're given particularly there in uh, 10 14 then his sacrifice of himself has set us right forever because he is God all too often our theories about the atonement place Jesus in contrast to God but Jesus is God, and I keep on wanting to emphasize that because that is a central perspective here. When Jesus came, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. There is no difference. And so any idea of payment, it, it doesn't make any sense. You cannot have one aspect of the Godhead paying another. They are equally involved in our salvation. Yes, he is the mediator of a new agreement. We read about that in Hebrews 9, verse 15. And Jesus offered himself once for all, Hebrews 7, 27 and 10, 10. And then we read, of course, in Hebrews 9, 22, that without the shedding of blood, nothing is made richly clean from the stain of sin. And that's absolutely true in terms of the Old Testament ritual. But when it comes to Jesus, the blood is a symbol of his life, of his death, of everything that he does, all that he is, in fact, because as it says in the Old Testament, the life is in the blood. And what we should be reading there is that Jesus' life is what he gave for us. In fact, when you come to the crucifixion, there's very little mention of blood, and certainly it wasn't taken, applied, and all those kinds of things that happen in the Old Testament rituals. So as we look at the various atonement theories, and here we'd have to tread very carefully because they are indeed theories. Many of them that we have are going right back to the early days of Christianity. How is it that Jesus actually makes us one? with himself, with God. That is the at one That is the actual meaning of the word atonement. It's not paying penalties, it's bringing us back into harmony, into oneness with God, and so we can be with him forever. And now we come to the whole idea of substitution. Yes, we can say Jesus died for me, absolutely. But we don't ever have this whole idea that there was a substitute sacrifice that instead of us paying a demanded penalty, Jesus paid a demanded penalty. No, God is not the one demanding anything in terms of a penalty. Sin pays a wage, the wage is death. God did not execute his son on the cross. Sin killed him. In fact, you could even say, when we include the Jewish leaders and the Romans and us as well, we killed Jesus. So we are the ones who sacrificed him, if you like. We are the ones who, because of our sinfulness, caused his death. So as we think of Jesus, our perfect sacrifice, let's not misunderstand it. God is not demanding any kind of satisfaction or appeasement or blood payment or anything like that. He is simply giving himself to us, saying, I want you back with me to be one with me for 
all eternity. Let's accept that and understand what being at one with God really means.